Okay, so it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce Tilman Burgstürmer, who is the Chief Scientific Officer of Alien Biotechnology. So Tilman is a self-professed CRISPR enthusiast, having helped produce the largest collection of isogenic human knockout cell lines during his time as CSO of Haplogen Genomics, and served as he also served as R&D Director and later Head of Innovation at Horizon Discovery. Uh, so in early 2018, Tillman decided to found Alien Biotechnology, where he currently serves as CSO, and he joins us today to explain how they're combining two transformative technologies, CRISPR screening and single cell transcriptomics, to enable genetic screening for complex phenotypes. So Tillman, uh, let me hand over to you. Fantastic. Um, thanks so much, Chris. Um, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, during the next 20 minutes, I would like... Um, to introduce you to the technology platform that we've built, um, um, which again sort of combines CRISPR perturbation with single cell RNA sequencing. And so to um, start, um, I thought I remind you, one second. Um, I thought um, I was going to remind you that there is still a huge need in the industry to identify and validate novel drug target and CRISP novel drug targets and CRISPR screens have become the prime discovery engine um, that allows us um, to do so in an unbiased fashion. And so um, for those of you who are not familiar with CRISPR, um, the Cas9 endonuclease can be programmed to introduce a double strand break pretty much anywhere in the human genome, allowing us to target um, human genes and inactivate them through the introduction of a frame shift mutation. Now in CRISPR screening, we do that at a very large scale, effectively allowing us to create a population of cells where every cell is a knockout for um, a different human gene. And then there are sort of two screening paradigms illustrated on this slide. Um, the first one is a screen in which, um, which is called a positive selection screen in which certain clones become more um, dominant, such as the red clones um, shown on this slide. And then the converse screening paradigm is a screen where um, certain clones disappear in the experiment. That's a dropout screen. And so now the key question becomes, which readouts can you actually connect to the screening workflow? And so the simplest screen that you can imagine, and those are effectively the screens that have been um, most um, sort of done um, so far, are the fitness screens. And so in a fitness screen, um, you might start um, with that um, unbiased um, population of cells harboring different gene knockouts, subject them to a compound treatment and ask a question whether certain gene knockouts become more or less susceptible um, following the drug treatment. The advantage of those screens is that they're really scalable. They have been performed at genome scale. Um, now, there is some middle ground. There is sort of um, um, a screening paradigm which is, is effectively based on fact sorting. This requires either um, the availability of a suitable cell surface antigen which can be stained with an antibody or um, it requires the introduction of an intracellular reporter much uh, like um, it's shown here for P53, which could be connected to uh, GFP. And so um, then you would sort of um, apply fact sorting to either, either isolate um, positive or negative um, um, cells in, in the facts experiment. Now, what you would really like to be able to do is a multi-parametric screen where you're not just looking for a single readout, which uh, you know could be fitness or or sort of on-off of a fax reporter, but where you really look at multiple parameters that you assess at the same time, and this is where single cell RNA sequencing becomes handy. And so, for those of you who haven't done single cell RNA sequencing, I wanted to quickly illustrate um, how this works. The the huge power here is that you're starting off um, your experiment in a pool fashion, meaning you might have a complex population of cells. You know, these could be blood cells, let's say, um, harboring the various um, sort of lineages um, that we know and love. But then um, you take that population and you isolate single cells in little oil droplets and you combine them in these oil droplets with barcoded beads. And so these beads are then covered with oligonucleotides 
that allow you to do the reverse transcription on the surface of these beads. And, and so the reverse transcription requires mRNAs to be polyadenylated. This becomes sort of an important step down the line. And so following the reverse transcription on the beads, you can actually throw all the material back together, do RNA sequencing. And because every bead contains a different barcode, you can sort of trace the transcriptome of a cell back um, to its origin through the cell barcode. Now, what we're doing is we're connecting this workflow to an upstream platform, um, which allows us to um, perturb genes using CRISPR. And so we're starting off with um, guide RNA uh, design. We're then using twists oligonucleotide pools um, to manuf manufacture a pooled guide RNA library that we introduce in a plasmid, then manufacture a lentivirus, and in fact, um, a Cas9 containing um, target cell population that we then sort of subject to the workflow. Now, why is it so difficult to combine these two technologies? It's so difficult um, because effectively you need to be able to connect the guide RNA that was present in a given cell to the transcriptome of that cell. Um, so as to assign which cell contained which CRISPR perturbation. And that's um, difficult um, because normally, um, it, or in most conventional um, guide RNA expression cassettes, um, guide RNAs are expressed from a Pol3 promoter, such as the U6 promoter, which is shown here. And that creates transcripts that have no poly A tail. Now, I told you in the previous slide that um, the reverse transcription on the surface um, of these beads requires a poly A tail. So now you could have the most beautiful experiment, but you would not be able to know which guide was present in which cell. And so Christoph Bock and Paul Duttlinger um, came up with this very elegant trick where they put the guide on an expression cassette downstream of a Pol2 promoter um, so as to create this fusion transcript, which um, fuses an upstream um, selection marker, in this case, the pyromycin gene, to the entire guide RNA expression cassette and um, creates a polyadenylated indicator transcript, which can then be captured on these beads that are conventionally used for single cell RNA sequencing. And this was the basis for um, the Nature Methods paper they published in 2017. And they call their workflow CropSeq because it's a combination of the CRISPR perturbation with droplet sequencing. Now, I should point out that there were other technical solutions to this problem, and they were published in, um, in a few other papers um, mentioned on this slide. And so um, before I now show you um, an example of um, what the CropSeq um, workflow can do, I wanted to quickly um, explain why we work with twists oligonucleotide pools. Um, and so here, we actually clone a fairly large library, um, much larger than we would normally use in a, in a CropSeq experiment. But this was a library of um, around 11,000 guide RNAs. And once we had cloned that library, we subjected it um, to next-gen sequencing at the level of the plasmid library. This is shown on the left, and at the level of the lentiviral library. And now for those CRISPR screens, it's, it's very important that each guide has an equal chance of being present in the population because that um, sort of warrants the unbiased nature of the screen. And so we were very gratified um, to see that in this, in this experiment with 11,000 guides, none of the 11,000 guides dropped out entirely and only 21 guides were present at a threshold of less than 10% of the median. This means that um, these oligos are present in, or are, are sort of printed in a very uniform fashion, allowing us to create um, quite unbiased, I would say very unbiased uh, libraries um, for our CRISPR screening platform. Now, um, the first example I wanted to um, show you um, was an example where we focused on a signaling pathway that is very well understood. And this is the signaling pathway that is initiated by type one interferon. And the reason we chose that pathway is that on the one hand, the pathway triggers a transcriptional program, which we can capture with CropSeq, 
And on the other hand, the signaling pathway is very well understood. And um, this allowed us to nominate a relatively short list of candidate genes. Um, and, and, it, and, and those should definitely include genes that have an impact um, in, in the signaling pathway. And so the library we started with in this uh, particular example was small. It had around 30 genes shown here on the right, and those were nominated based on um, the CAC pathways, which contain sort of published knowledge on pathway architecture. And so then um, the screen was done in a way that, um, again, we, we designed the guides in-house. We designed three guide RNAs per gene for a total of uh, 27 genes. We included some non-targeting guides, assembled um, the oligonucleotide pool using TWIST's um, oligo platform, then cloned um, the lentivirus library and introduced it into Cas9 containing RKO cells um, through a recombinant lentivirus. And at day eight, um, following the um, infection with a lentiviral guide library, we treated cells um, for three hours with type 1 interferon and then submitted two independent um, experiments um, for single cell RNA sequencing, meaning you, know, you first do the single cell RNA library prep and then um, do a Novasic run um, to um, acquire um, the, the downstream sort of next-gen sequencing data. And so in this experiment, we um, used roughly 10,000 cells per um, condition, um, and, we, and we needed approximately 600 million reads um, for that experiment to be sort of properly represented. And so um, before I show you the data, I would like to sort of explain how we visualize um, the data that come out of those screens. Um, the data from um, single cell RNA sequencing experiments is quite complex. And the reason is that one experiment typically has 10,000 cells. And in each of those cells, um, we can potentially um, look at each of the 20,000 human genes. So it's a, it's a 10,000 by 20,000 matrix, um, and, and we have for each of those um, experiments 300 million NGS reads. Now, it's not easy to imagine that, that you can look at it at an Excel table with, with a data set that complex. And so there are two ways to visualize um, the, the data. One is um, what I call here the single cell view. So here um, we're using a tool or a technology called UMAP which essentially looks at uh, the variability that's in the data and um, sort of transforms this very complex data set onto two dimensions that give us the best possible separation um, in the experiment. Each of the dots in that representation is one cell and cells that are similar will cluster um, together. Now, the second way of, of looking at the data is that, um, um, and that is particularly useful in our case, is um, that you can aggregate across all the cells that pertain to a particular genotype. So in, this, in the screening um, setup that I just showed you, what we typically do is we look at all the knockouts um, for a given gene and we sort of integrate all the data we have from all the 50 to 100 cells um, per genotype and represent that in a, con in a more conventional heat map. And so for the, for the interferon screen, I would like to show you um, the, um, the UMAP, the single cell view first. And so here again, you know, um, we're doing this unbiased analysis of um, the single cell transcriptomes that were recovered from the experiment. And then a posteriori, we're coloring those cells um, 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 dependent on whether they come from the control condition or the type 1 interferon stimulation. And you can nicely appreciate that those two populations are well separated. And so this would indicate that a lot of the variance that we observe in this experiment arises due to um, type 1 interferon stimulation. Now we can also ask what are the genes that are differentially expressed between those two different populations. And it's very reassuring to see in that list a lot of genes that start with an I, with a letter I, and those were genes um, that were originally described or discovered even as um, interferon-regulated genes. That's why um, um, they start with a letter I. 
So it would say that a lot of the genes that we find differentially regulated are indeed um, type 1 interferon-induced genes. Now, how does the CRISPR perturbation affect um, the type 1 interferon stimulation? So here now we're turning to the aggregated view that I described to you earlier. So on the x-axis, we're looking at the CRISPR perturbations um, that we introduced um, through our um, guide RNA library. And then at the y-axis, we're looking at the genes that um, um, change most dramatically in the experiment. And again, I'm plotting here a selection of those genes that change most. Of course, we have, we could sort of potentially look at a longer list um, on the y-axis. And so what you can appreciate is that um, if you focus your attention on the very left of the graph first, there is a quite significant difference between unstimulated and stimulated cells harboring non-targeting guides. So that's good. It means cells were indeed stimulated. But then if you focus on um, the, the CRISPR perturbation, there is a clear set of seven regulators that have a significant, that show a significantly diminished um, interferon stimulation and a set of just two negative regulators that if knocked out show an enhanced stimulation. And if you compare um, those seven regulators to the, um, the textbook schematic that I included, um, you will appreciate that um, uh, there is a great deal of overlap. Um, the genes that were required to maintain interferon stimulation were the two interferon receptor subunits, if not one and two, two kinases, TIC2 and JAK1, and then this tripartite complex of STAT1, STAT2, and IRF9. So those were known from the literature to be the key components, and we recovered them um, in the experiment. Now, this is the first part of the talk. In the second part of the talk, I wanted to show you some exciting new data um, that we have gathered very recently. And before I start, I wanted to sort of make the point that if you look at these unbiased single cell RNA sequencing data sets and you ask, what are the genes that actually change? You'd be surprised to see that there are very few genes that are actually changing. And this is sort of highlighted in this plot which plots the expression level of the gene against um, the variance that's observed in the unbiased um, single cell RNA sequencing experiment. And so what that means is that you're actually wasting a lot of sequencing power on um, mRNAs, on genes that are, that are not really changing and that are thus not providing any information content. And so what you would really like to be able to do is focus in on those genes that vary between cells. And there is actually a way to do that, and it's sort of a combination of single cell RNA sequencing with a downstream PCR-based approach. And so the upstream uh, part here is, is a different one, um, at least in the experiment that I'm going to share in a minute. It's a microwell-based uh, separation where cells get seeded on a microwell plate, and then we put the barcoded beads in and they land um, stochastically in these, in these wells. And sort of whenever a cell and a, and a bead land in the same well, reverse transcription can occur in the surface of the beads, much like um, it's been shown in the previous approach. But then step three is really novel. And step three, instead of then sort of doing unbiased sequencing, we have a step in between where we work with a pre-designed library, a pre-designed panel of uh, primers, which allows us to selectively amplify certain mRNAs of our liking. And um, this is what we did for the exact same experimental workflow. So we chose a selection of 75 mRNAs, many of which um, were um, interferon response genes that we could nominate from the, from the previous um, experiment that I just showed you. And then sort of ran the targeted workflow with these 75 mRNAs. And we did the NGS experiment. Um, we roughly needed um, 160 million reads for 10,000 cell transcriptomes. And then the first question we had, how many of those mRNAs did we actually find? And we were very um, happy to see that um, the median cell had 50 out of the 75 mRNAs represented. And um, here we look at, at all those 75 genes on the x-axis and we ask, 
how frequently do we see those mRNAs in uh, sort of across the entire cell population? And again, you'll appreciate that we see a lot of those um, mRNAs, roughly two thirds, in 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 many of the of the cells in the experiment, many of the ten thousand cells in the experiment. And what's even more interesting is that we can now downsample that data. So that um, again, you know, the experiment was done with 160 million reads, 10,000 cells. So that would mean um, 16,000 reads per cell. But we can now sort of a posteriori take less reads per cell and ask how would that change the, the representation of the experiment? And we feel we can go down at least to 3,000 reads per cell, maybe less, and obtain essentially the same degree of information. Now that's very exciting because it says that we can get away with much less reads in the experiment without losing critical information. So it makes, it means we, we sort of do not have to sacrifice quality, um, um, but can get the experiment done um, at a much lower cost. So on the next slide, we're compa comparing the sparsity of the data um, that we obtain um, with a whole transcriptome sequencing experiment that I showed in the first half of the talk with this targeted amplification experiment. And you, you'll appreciate that here we're looking at 20 independent clones um, and, and, and we're looking at the representation of these interferon-induced um, genes. And you'll appreciate that the data is pretty sparse, meaning um, there are a lot of um, cells which do not contain, in fact, there, there is hardly any cell that contains all of these markers. Now, if we look at the targeted sequencing experiment, with very few exceptions, we see most of these uh, genes represented in each of the 20 clones um, that we look at. And um, it's, it's very exciting because the targeted sequencing data that we plot here um, were obtained at a tenth of the number of reads per cell. So the targeted sequencing data were collected at 3,000 reads per cell, while the whole transcriptome sequencing required 30,000 um, reads per cell. And so on my, on my last slide, um, I realize I'm sort of running out of time. On my last slide, I would like to highlight um, that these experiments are not only cheaper, but they also provide a greater dynamic range. And so here we're putting these two heat maps. Again, on the x-axis, we have the CRISPR perturbation. On the y-axis, we have the type one interferon um, signature. From, from the two experiments side by side, again, the, the targeted sequencing was done at 3,000 reads per cell. The whole transcriptome was done at 30,000 reads per cell. But then we adjusted the scale of the data to a similar scale. Um, and what you can easily appreciate is that the dynamic range of the targeted sequencing data is much greater than that of the whole transcriptome sequencing. Um, this, this may not be surprising, but, but again, it's very gratifying um, to see. And it really says that if you can nominate your um, mRNA signature a priori, um, it, this would sort of give you a much greater dynamic range um, in the experiment. And so with that, I would like to summarize. Um, we really believe transcriptomics is a generic readout. It's a generic phenotype that will be applicable across many areas of biology and, and, and drug discovery. At Alien, we combine um, CRISPR perturbation with single cell RNA sequencing using the CropSeq workflow that was developed by Paul Duttlinger and Chris Bock in um, Chris Bock's academic lab. Christoph Bock um, is a, is a co-founder of Alien. We use TWIST's oligonucleotide libraries because they warrant uh, the assembly of unbiased um, guide RNA libraries because they're very uniform. I showed you the example of a CropSeq screen um, um, on, the, on the type 1 interference signaling pathway. And um, we're very excited about these recent targeted sequencing data that seem to suggest that we can get a much greater dynamic range at a lower NGS cost. And um, I would like to thank um, the entire team that contributed um, to this experiment, um, mainly Julian Jude, um, who really spearheaded the CRISPR efforts at Alien, but also Astrid Helm, Sarah Oberndorfer, and Adam Krejci. And with that, I would like to close and ask them for the poll question.